Good morning. The committee will come to order. The Oversight Committee exists to secure two fundamental principles. First, Americans have a right to know that the money Washington takes from them is well spent. And second, Americans deserve an effective, efficient government that works for them. Our duty on the Oversight and Government Reform Committee is to protect these rights. Our solemn responsibility is to hold government accountable to taxpayers, because taxpayers have a right to know what they get from their government. We will work tirelessly in partnership with citizen watchdogs to deliver the facts to the American people and bring genuine reform to the Federal bureaucracy. This is our mission. Today's hearing is entitled, Pain at the Pump. But it goes beyond that. Pain at the pump is what the American people see. The American people see an administration who said before they came to Washington that we need European oil prices. We need $8 a barrel gasoline. Although they have only gotten us to $4 a barrel, we are clearly on a pathway to someday soon having European-style cost of, of energy. Worse than that, it is likely that that energy will be imported. It will represent jobs many miles away and governments that are often hostile to us who profit from high oil prices. Having failed to get cap-and-trade passed, it appears as though this administration is finding alternative ways to achieve the equivalent. Secretary Chu, before joining the Cabinet, said, and I will put it on the screen, somehow we have to figure out how to boost the price of gasoline to the levels of Europe. That is not my statement. That is the administration's statement. Additionally, the President has repeatedly, as a candidate, said that there will be pain trans, uh, in transition, that prices will skyrocket. These are not our words. These are the President's words. So as we watch the cost skyrocket, as we watch impediments to job creation here, particularly in onshore, I repeat, onshore oil and natural gas, we, we ask the question, are we seeing by regulation what, which, what cannot be done by legislation? Let us not forget, this, this committee has a long history of going after agencies that fail to do their job on the other side. Our history of going after Mineral Management Service, although good, lacks only one conclusion. Having proven that MMS was unable to supervise properly the oil and natural gas industry, that it was, in fact, an out-of-control entity, we failed to get real reform under the Bush administration. We then failed to get real reform under the Obama administration, and the American people suffered in the Gulf. This committee will do both ensure that agencies meet their obligation to allow the production and exploration of minerals here in America while ensuring that they also meet the safety requirements. With that, I recognize the ranking member for his opening statement. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. And I would remind the Chairman that this is our watch. We are on the earth today, and we have a duty to leave a better environment than the one we found when we were born. I just want to take a moment to remember why we are here today. We are not here because of a conspiracy theory that the administration is deliberately increasing gas prices. And we are not here because of so-called prematorium or a de facto moratorium on drilling permits. That does not really exist. We are here because on April 20, 2010, a massive oil explosion in the Gulf of Mexico killed 11 people and launched the worst environmental disaster in the history of our country. We all watched as the oil spewed into the water for days and days and days. And for the entire summer, there was nothing we could do but wait and pray. Ladies and gentlemen, we are better than that. Finally, after 87 days, it stopped, but not, not before releasing 200 million gallons of oil not before reaching 780 miles along the Gulf, not before devastating the Gulf's commercial and recreational fishing industries, and not before decimating the Gulf's travel and tourism industries, which represent nearly half 
of the Gulf's economy, generate over $100 billion a year, and are responsible for more than a million jobs. We also represent them, by the way. That is why we are here. And we can never, ever, never, ever forget. So thank you, Administrator Jackson and Deputy Secretary Hayes, for testifying today about the Administration's efforts to prevent this kind of disaster from ever happening again. We are also here because of recent increases in the price of gas, which has now surpassed $4 per gallon. These increases make it harder for average Americans to get to work and for small businesses to function. I, remember, I remind members of this committee that they are our constituents. Chairman Issa issued a report today that essentially blames the Obama administration for everything, including higher gas prices. In fact, former Alaska Governor Sarah Palin has been espousing this exact same theory for several months now. The problem is that this theory has been debunked by conservative and industry experts. For example, <clears throat> Michael Keynes, the former chief economist for the American Petroleum Institute said this, and I quote, it is not credible to blame the Obama administration's drilling policies for today's high prices. Ken Green, a resident scholar with the American Enterprise Institute, said this, and I quote, the world price is the world price. Even if we were producing 100 percent of our oil, we probably couldn't produce enough to affect the world price of oil, end of quote. Chris Lafakis, an economist at Moody's Analytics, said this, there is absolutely no merit to this viewpoint whatsoever, end of quote. In other words, when you actually talk to experts who know the industry and who know the facts, these arguments are exposed as blatant attempts to score political points with no basis in fact. I also released a report today, and I ask unanimous consent that it be made a part of the official record of today's hearing. Without objection, so ordered. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. My report analyzed what industry, government, and academic experts actually believe is causing higher gas prices, and that is ex ex excessive speculation by entities that have no consumption interest in the underlying commodities and that profit by doing nothing more than forecasting price trends. The report's chief conclusion is that in order to make the most significant impact on the lowering gas prices, our primary focus should be on countering the growing impact of energy speculation, rather than simply promoting the oil industry's priorities of increasing domestic drilling. At, <clears throat> as the report finds, addressing excessive speculation offers the single most significant opportunity to reduce gas prices for American consumers. Experts, including oil industry officials and investment firms, estimate that excessive oil speculation could be inflating prices by 30 percent, but increasing domestic drilling would impact prices by only 1 percent and then only after a decade or more. In my opinion, this committee could have a much more significant and immediate impact on the price of gas if it stopped focusing solely on the oil industry's interests and started focusing on real efforts to help American consumers. Again, I remind our committee, this is our watch. We are on the earth today. We must protect our environment. We must protect the fishermen. We must protect the tourist industry. We must have balance. And so, Mr. Chairman, I hope that you and I can work together in a bipartisan manner to effectively and efficiently conduct an investigation into these issues so that the American people might have relief. With that, I yield back. I thank the ranking member. Uh, I ask unanimous consent that uh, the Politico article of April 26, uh, entitled EPA Chief Gas Price is Not Our Fault, in which the Administrator says what appears to be the most important factor at work is our dependence on imported energy, uh, be entered into the record. Without objection, so ordered. All members will have five legislative days in which to put their opening statements in. And with that, we, we, we move to our panel of witnesses. The Honorable Lisa Jackson is the Administrator of the United States Environmental Protection Agency. Our second witness, the Honorable David Hayes, is the Deputy Secretary of the Department of Interior. As I have told both of our witnesses earlier, we are on an unusually tight schedule. We will uh, adjourn uh, to be with the joint session of Congress in, at 11 o'clock. And so I am going to execute a very heavy gavel. I, won't, I don't want to be unfair to anyone, but I would like everyone to understand that we will end each uh, round at five minutes, including each of the opening statements. Uh, this is intended to give everyone an opportunity to be, to be heard. Uh, it will not be our usual talk until the zero and then expect an answer. Uh, 
So pursuant to the committee rules, all witnesses must be sworn before testifying. Would you please rise to take the oath and raise your right arm? Do you solemnly swear or affirm that the testimony you are about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Let, your, let the record reflect that both uh, witnesses answered in the affirmative. Please be seated. With that, Administrator Jackson is recognized. Thank you, Chairman Issa. To, rank, to you, Ranking Member Cummings and members of the committee, thank you for inviting me to testify. Americans are again suffering at the pump. Gasoline and diesel cost more today than they did a year ago. As ExxonMobil's CEO recently testified, the prices of those fuels are a function of crude oil prices, which are set by global supply and demand. As a matter of geology, America will never control more than a tiny fraction of the world's oil supply. Therefore, America cannot prevent gasoline and diesel prices from rising. Still, all else being equal, buying a barrel of American oil is better than buying a barrel of foreign oil. Last year, American oil production reached its highest level since 2003, and President Obama recently announced steps that the Interior Department is taking to increase safe and responsible oil production here at home. Deputy Secretary Hayes will describe those steps today. For parts of the outer continental shelf, Congress has declared that a company cannot operate drilling equipment that emits large amounts of air pollution without first demonstrating, through EPA permitting, that the emissions will not harm Americans. That requirement is not simply red tape, because a single exploratory drilling operation can emit as much air pollution on a daily basis as a lar large oil refinery. In 2007, Shell Oil began seeking from EPA's Region 10 office air permits for exploratory drilling operations on the Outer Continental Shelf off Alaska. Region 10 has since issued five permits to Shell. An administrative court called the Environmental Appeals Board remanded two of the permits last December after Alaska residents had challenged them. I am confident that we will give the Board the analysis it has called for in time for the permits to be upheld before the start of the next drilling season. I should note that, on average, the Board decides air permit appeals in just over five months, that only four of the Board's more than 100 air, air permit decisions have ever been appealed to a Federal court, and that none of the Board's air permit decisions has ever been overturned. Currently, there are only four pending air permit applications for drilling on the Arctic OCS. That includes the two that I just mentioned. We anticipate many more, though. So at the President's direction, the White House has formed a team of relevant bureaus at the Department of Interior, the Department of Commerce, and EPA to coordinate closely and prevent unnecessary delays. Thanks to advances in drilling technology, including hydraulic fracturing or fracking, America's, America's potential natural gas resource is nearly 50 percent larger than we believed it was just a few years ago. The price we pay for natural gas is not set on a global market the way the price of oil is, and burning natural gas creates less air pollution than burning other fossil fuels. So increasing America's natural gas production is a good thing. Fracking involves injecting chemicals underground at high pressure, and various substances come back to the surface with the gas. It is not surprising, then, that Congress has directed EPA to study the relationship between fracking and drinking water. We are doing that, with input from technical experts, the public, and industry. In the meantime, EPA will step in as necessary to protect local residents if drilling jeopardizes clean water. That said, State governments are appropriately the first line of defense against harmful or unsafe drilling practices. We can mitigate the impact of high fuel prices on American families and businesses by enabling them to travel the same distances and conduct the same commerce on less gasoline and diesel. The fuel efficiency standards that EPA and the Department of Transportation established last year for new cars and light trucks will save the average American driver $3,000 over the life of the car and conserve 1.85 billion barrels of oil. Additional standards that we will set this summer for heavy-duty trucks will save a tractor-trailer rig operator up to $74,000 over the life of the rig and conserve another half a billion barrels of oil. The increased biofuel production mandates that EPA set last year will displace 7 percent of America's expected gasoline and diesel consumption in 2022, while decreasing oil imports by $41.5 billion. I am proud of the role EPA is playing to shield Americans from the harmful economic impact of high gasoline and diesel prices. EPA's core mission, though, is protecting Americans from harmful pollution. 
That is what Congress has ordered EPA to do, and that is what the American people expect. Even when gas prices are high and the economy is still recovering, Americans do not like it when their families and livelihoods are harmed by industrial pollution that could have been avoided. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. <clears throat> thank you, Mr. Secretary. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, uh, Ranking Member Cummings. I uh, appreciate the opportunity to give a short oral statement and request that my written statement be submitted for the record. Without objections, so ordered. Uh, as you know, the President has emphasized the importance of securing our energy future by pursuing a multi-pronged strategy that includes increased domestic oil and gas production, improved energy efficiency, and the production of alternative fuels. The President reviewed his comprehensive plan in the Energy Blueprint document that he released last month. And when discussing this plan, the President emphasized that there is no quick fix to address high gas prices and that rather than, quote, rushing to propose action when gas prices rise, then hitting the snooze button when they fall again, end quote, we need to pursue a comprehensive strategy. The Department of the Interior has a key role in this regard in addressing today's and tomorrow's energy issues. Our Department, for example, is, for the first time in history, permitting utility-scale renewable energy projects on our public lands and on our offshore, in, in our offshore waters. Last year, we permitted more than 4,000 megawatts of renewable solar, geothermal, and wind projects, the equivalent of more than a dozen medium-sized coal-fired power plants. At the same time, however, our Department is focused on increasing domestic oil and gas production from our public lands and our offshore waters. The facts show that our emphasis on responsible oil and gas development, combined with the efficiency improvements that the administration has introduced with our transportation fleet and that Administrator Jackson just referenced, is paying off. Over the past three years, our domestic oil and gas production has gone up, while our imports have gone down. Oil imports in 2008 were 57 percent of the total uh, oil consumed in the United States. Today, it is less than 50 percent. Oil production is higher in 2010 than it has been in any year since 2003. Offshore oil production in the last three years has gone up by a third, by approximately 200,000 barrels a year, a million barrels a year, and production onshore has gone up 5 percent during the same period. The President is committed to seeing this trend continue. As you know, he has vowed to cut our oil imports by one-third by 2025 down from the 11 million barrels per day that we were importing when he took office. At the Interior Department, we are taking a number of steps to facilitate responsible oil and gas development in the U.S. First, we are providing industry with ample opportunity to develop domestic oil and gas supplies. Offshore, in 2009 and 2010, our Department offered 53 million and 37 million acres, respectively, for leasing. Onshore, we heard, we've held 29 lease sales in 2010. We have scheduled 33 lease sales for this year. Notably, industry has not taken full advantage of the lands we've opened up to them for development. Offshore, out of the 53 and 37 million acres offered, industry leased 2.7 million and 2.4 million acres, respectively. And of the total offshore leased average, fully 70 percent of the leased uh, areas are idle. Onshore, out of the 6.5 million acres offered for lease during our administration, less than half were leased. And 55 percent of the overall acreage that is leased is idle. That is, 22 million acres are currently available onshore for development, leased and in the hands of domestic oil and gas companies, but there is no exploration or development occurring. The President has initiated additional actions to further incentivize the oil and gas industry to utilize these available domestic oil uh, and gas resources. He announced that last week in his radio address and amplified it, uh, early, it was amplified uh, earlier this week by the Secretary, uh, including the fact that leases in the Gulf impacted by the moratorium are being extended by a year, leases in Alaskan waters are being extended, new lease sales will be scheduled for the Gulf of Mexico. Uh, with the first one occurring by the end of the year and two more before the mid-next year. The President announced that BLM will have annual lease sales in the National Petroleum Reserve Alaska. And we are looking for ways to encourage industry to invest earlier in their leases by considering financial and lease term incentives for early development. In our view, it makes no sense 
to have leased acreage available to oil companies. And if oil companies are not going to develop those leases, they should be put back in, and made available to other companies who may make those investments. We are confident that our continued focus on responsible oil and gas development uh, will maintain and accelerate the decline of oil imports. Despite this evidence, some have suggested that domestic oil and gas development is in decline and that high gas prices are due to limited production. Again, the facts tell a different story. Uh, Ranking uh, Member Cummings discussed the, the fact that oil price is set on a global basis. Um, and let me say that our permitting is also not a constraint. Today, we have 7,000 approved permits to drill on onshore resources that are sitting on the shelf and not being used. Again, 22 million of acres have been leased and are available for development. In the offshore, as I will discuss in the Q&A, after the Macondo well situation and the need to upgrade safety standards, we are back in business in the Gulf with 55 new permits in the shallow water and uh, 14 new permits in deep water. Uh, in the shallow water, we are at approximately the same pace of permitting that we were in 2009, uh, and we are in a strong uh, uh, process, uh, we are strongly processing our deep water permits as well. Um, my time is up. I would like to just conclude by saying we, have, we, have, uh, we are increasing our oil and gas uh, production at the same time that we are reforming uh, the former Minerals Management Service. And Chairman Issa, I know you have had a personal interest in that, and I hope I will have the opportunity to provide a little more information in the Q&A about the pace of our reform effort. Thank you. Thank you. I recognize myself for five minutes. Uh, and I first ask unanimous consent that the majority uh, report uh, be placed in the record, since it uh, is exactly the opposite, if you, no surprise, of the minority report. Without objection, so ordered. Mr. Secretary, uh, you know, in this town, everyone is entitled to an opinion, uh, but not facts. Why can you name one reason that in Alaska the Federal Treasury has received $2.2 billion in Federal lease money during your administration and additionally another billion has been invested by the oil companies in exploration, and yet they have gotten nothing back, in no small part because Shell and others have been delayed in actually receiving the permit? So aren't you willing to take at least some responsibility for the fact that a lease is not a permit? And when you call it idle, are you really saying it is idle? And this is the real question. Are they idle or are they not yet producing? Would you please explain yourself on your figures? Isn't it true your figures are, when you say idle, not yet producing, and it can well mean that money is being invested? The, um, the term, as described in the report that was provided to the President and that I am sure your staff has available, made it clear that by idle it means that there is no active exploration or production occurring. Does that mean there is no, no permit request or environmental uh, impact being done? Uh, there may be some activity, but there is no exploration activity. So again, a, a lease costing $2.2 billion in Alaska the stockholders would sue and win if they were if it was not in the best interest of the company to do everything they could to get a return on their 2.2 billion isn't it true i can't speak to a, a shareholder's rights i do know that we are working with shell very closely to address their interests and we have just in the last month received exploration plans that we are processing for the potential exploration of those permits next summer right which is one year later than it would have been if it had been processed in a timely fashion. Uh, you know, there is a, uh, a belief that, uh, that, in fact, prices are artificially high because of speculators. I am not going to debunk that. I am going to ask you a simple question. If we got all of the resources of oil and natural gas from both Federal and private lands that are estimated to be available, isn't it true? that we could be energy self-sufficient for 100 years. Isn't that what the, all the studies show? I am not saying that it is an easy goal, but with fracking and other technology, isn't it true we could raise at least 40 percent, which would put us marginally within self-sufficiency? If you include Canada, it would make us self-sufficient. Yes or no, isn't that true? Uh, I don't know if you are referring to technically recoverable resources or economically recoverable resources, uh, Mr. Well, at $100 a barrel isn't isn't it more than enough to be economically recoverable, not just technically recoverable? 
Um, I, I really don't know uh, the answer to that question. Okay. Well, I, if you would answer for the record, I would appreciate it. Certainly will. Uh, for, for the administrator, I have just got a very simple question, and both sides will have other questions that probably will be more thoughtful in some ways. But in your opening statement, you talked about the requirement to make sure that the, these drilling rigs that were, quote, uh, as big as much pollution as a, uh, a refinery. Isn't it true that when China is drilling just south of our border uh, in Cuban waters, isn't it true that they do just as much polluting or more than anybody pro producing just slightly north of that in U.S. waters? Isn't it true that the global um, amount of global pollution will actually be higher if, the, if it's produced outside the U.S. than if it's produced inside the U.S.? Yes or no? That's certainly possible. I don't. I don't know what emissions come from Chinese rigs. What I can say is that the oh yes, you that do. You know that sorry. we have some of the highest standards of emissions in the world. Isn't that true? Our standards are high because under the Clean Air Act passed by Congress, we are right. told to protect the health of Americans, including from pollutants that are not global pollutants. They can be quite local, like SO2, particulate matter, and smog, which can affect everyone from those on a cruise ship in Alaskan waters to recreational and commercial I appreciate fishing. that. But isn't it true that the primary pollutants, especially uh, those that you were talking about earlier, in fact, are global pollutants? They are certainly emitted globally, sir, but they have local impacts as Last well. Last but not least, isn't it true that more oil is, has been spilled in the Pacific by importation than by actual drilling over the last 30 years? I don't have the figures. I do. It has been. I now recognize the ranking member. <laughs> Let me make it clear, uh, Administrator Jackson, I want us to have high standards. I want us to set uh, a model for the world. We are, this is the United States of America, and we are better than that. On May 12, 2010, Rex Tillerson, the CEO, of Exxon Mobil testified before the Senate Finance Committee along with CEOs of five other major oil companies. During this testimony, he estimated that without excessive speculation, oil would be adding, trading at $60 to $70 a barrel instead of roughly $100 a barrel. Uh, is either of you familiar with this, uh, these comments, Ms. Jackson? Yes, sir. And, and you, uh, Mr. Hayes? Yes, Director yes, Hayes. Well, he is not alone. On April 11, Goldman Sachs issued a warning to its investment clients. Now, this is, this is Goldman Sachs uh, that said speculators may be inflating the price of oil by as much as $27 a barrel. So that is uh, very close to Mr. Tillerson's estimate of about 30 percent. Mr. Hayes, are you aware of that estimate by Goldman Sachs? And are you aware, uh, Administrator Jackson? I am, I am uh, Mr. Uh, uh, ranking Member, and I also uh, note that uh, your staff paper laid this out in quite a bit of uh, persuasive detail. And you, Mr. Jackson? Yes, sir. The United States Energy, let me, let me, let me uh, turn to a different estimate. The United States Energy Information Administration, EIA, is the nation's foremost independent, independent source of energy analysis. In 2009, EIA examined the potential impact of expanding domestic oil drilling to the outer continental shelf of the Atlantic and Pacific coasts and the eastern and central regions of the Gulf of Mexico. EIA issued a report concluding that there would be no, and I emphasize no, changes in gas prices by the year 2020 and that there would be a decrease of only 3 cents per gallon by the year 2030. Mr. Hayes, are you familiar with the EIA estimate? And Administrator Jackson, are you familiar? I am. Yes, sir. Well, let me uh, put all of this together. On one hand, you have the oil company CEOs and investment banks saying that excessive speculation may be inflating prices by 30 percent. Now, that is the oil company CEOs and investment banks. On the other hand, you have the Energy Information Administration saying that opening up vast portions of the outer continental shelf would result in only a three-cent difference 20 years from now. So the question is, let me ask you both, and let me ask you as drivers and consumers, if you could save a dollar per gallon or only three cents per gallon, you would save the dollar, wouldn't you? Yes, sir. Hello? Yes, sir. Here is my point. 
This committee has a tremendous and awesome opportunity to really help everyday Americans, like the ones I saw going to work this morning in Baltimore, getting up at 5.30, filling up their tanks and costing them more. We have, we, it is our duty to help them. But we have limited resources, we, so we have to prioritize. It seems to me that addressing excessive speculation offers a much, much better opportunity to help lower gas prices rather than focusing our efforts on expanding domestic drilling, which will help oil company profits but will make little difference on the price of gas, which people try to get to work every day, try to get to church on Sunday, try to take their kids to the baseball game. They are trying to just go out, not go out, go to Disney World from Baltimore, but just go to the local uh, Arby's and have, uh, have, a, have a lunch. Even if these estimates are half of what the experts predict, they still dwarf any conceivable cost benefit we get from additional drilling. Let me just close by quoting CFTC Commissioner Bart Chilton. On April 20th, 2011, 2011, April 20th, 2011, he said this, and I quote, this is a Wall Street premium on gas prices. He went on to say, every time folks fill up their tanks, they can expect that several dollars are due to speculation. I didn't say that. He said that. And so I hope that we have a chance to investigate this issue more in detail in the future. And I, re I will say it until the day I die. We have a duty as members of this Congress to leave our children with an better environment than the one we found on the day we were born. With that, I yield back. Thank the gentleman. We now recognize the gentleman from Utah, Mr. Chaffetz, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, my understanding is the Department of uh, Energy was created on April 1, 1977. I remember as a small child being with my dad when we go to the gas lines and couldn't get gas. We, so we created this Department of Energy. But over the course of time, when we were importing roughly, in its very rough numbers, 40 percent of our, of our oil needs were being imported, that, mo that number moved closer to 60 percent. The Federal Government has failed under two different type, uh, very different types of administrations to wean our way off of the need to import oil from overseas. And yet what I find now is every time I turn around and you see companies willing and wanting to invest heavily with the hope and the idea, the speculation that they are going to be able to actually produce some energy resources, and not just oil, but natural gas, coal, those types of things, that it is the EPA and the BLM, the Department of Interior, that are putting up so many roadblocks that we can't extract the resources that we have in our own very backyard. Now, one of my core questions here is, particularly for the BLM, I am from Utah, I am a representative from Utah, is that it, it appears that the administration, in its frustration and in its inability to actually have legislation passed, is going to go ahead and use its rulemaking authority and just bypass the Congress and, and put up some rules and roadblocks and, and, and implement things that would never pass this body. Even when the Democrats had the House, the Senate, and the Presidency, they couldn't pass cap and trade. The Red Rock Wilderness Act is something that has been introduced many times here in Congress, has never even come close to being implemented. And then the Wildlands Policy, which, you know, kind of two days before Christmas is implemented. That should be a flashing red light to the American public that something was wrong when that was introduced. My question for, for the Deputy Secretary here, um, in citing those, is it the policy of the BLM to just go ahead and implement this stuff anyway? I mean, at what point does the BLM say, okay, we are going to use this information and we are just going to go with it anyway? Uh, Congressman, the, the intent of the reform efforts uh, BLM has had uh, is to provide more clarity uh, for industry and for other interests in how the public lands But that clarity used. should be based on what is passed in the United States Congress and oh, signed by the President. Absolutely. Okay. Section, Section 202 of the Federal Lands Management Policy Act provides the authority and the responsibility for BLM to make the but decisions that it is making. But not before it becomes law, correct? It is law already. No, we no. Have the, but, we but have the regulatory. If something, if something hasn't become law, if something hasn't become law, then you are not supposed to be doing, dealing with it, right? Let us put up, let me deal with this first slide here. This is an official map from the BLM, severe lake, lake tracks map, and then it goes through with the number. In one of those designations, if you look over the right, it talks about, as one of the things, the Red Rock, Red Rock proposal. 
why does the BLM issue an official map with the Red Rock proposal designated on it when it has yet to become law? Uh, there is simply a map. There is no uh, regulatory implication to the Red Rock Wilderness area at all, Congressman. What we are trying to do is reduce the, the problem that has developed in the last several years when prior administrations essentially leased whatever industry uh, nominated wherever. Okay, and, and the you protests can, you on those cannot leases— stand. You, that is not true. That is such a miscalculation. That is such a gross exaggeration of the reality. You cannot sit here and say they just leased whatever. That is not true. There the, are rules and regulations, and they abided by those. The, it wasn't the, just sign up and you get it. The, the facts you are losing total credibility when you make a statement like that. The, the facts are, Congressman, that in 1998, 1 percent of the leases nominated and, in fact, leased uh, to industry were protested. When we came into office, 48 percent of all leases were being protested because of, of broad-scale concerns that BLM was not taking into account its multiple-use mission and leasing in areas that made sense. We want to reduce the litigation. Short. I got just a few seconds here. My sorry. On December 22, 2010, Secretary Salazar issued Special Order 30, 3310, which created the wildlands. Uh, but it was also uh, the policy of the Department of Interior, it seems to have actually implemented that. Even though it, when we passed the CR, there is no funding for the wildlands. Is it the policy, yes or no, to implement the wildlands? Is it the policy uh, we, of the BLM to actually implement we, it? We will not implement the wildlands policy. We will honor the, the congressional rider. Thank you. My time is Would up. the gentleman yield? Yes. Uh, should we on the dais consider that the amount of environmental leftists who sue and protest is the basis for whether or not the, these are valid leases or not? So a growth in, in lawsuits uh, exponentially is, in fact, simply a growth and a difference between the Clinton administration and the Bush administration as far as who decides to sue, right? Uh, I, I would say, Congressman, that it is indicative of a, a, an additional challenge for industry and for other parties to develop their oil and gas resources in an economic and timely manner. No one wants that sort of litigation. Okay, my time has expired. The gentleman from Illinois, Mr. Quigley. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Secretary, um, the world seems to be focused on just one spill, the horizon spill. Could you give some quick summary of sort of how much how many spills take place in a routine year, not just in water, but in, in Alaska, the degree of these, the incidents that took place in Prudhoe, uh, and the fact that this isn't just an isolated incident, as bad as it was? I would be happy, Congressman, to give you those uh, statistics for the record. I don't have them offhand. There are a number of spills. Obviously, the Macondo well was uh, enormously anomalous in its size, but there are routine spills that occur. In, in the ocean? Yes. And in Alaska, the same hundreds in the course of a year, correct? I am not sure there are hundreds that occur in Alaska. I, I promise you, you, you will find that when you, you give us these numbers. And the significant spills which have taken place already, including Prudhoe Bay, you would pass that on as well? It certainly will, Congressman. Ms. Jackson, I know you had limited time at the beginning of your um, introduction. Could you elaborate to a certain degree on the issues with fracking and the concerns that you have from your initial analysis of the issues? Uh, certainly, sir. Um, uh, first, let me, let me start by saying that, in general, states have been regulating various aspects of oil and gas exploration and recovery and are on the front lines of that. EPA has certain authorities under the Clean Water Act and the Clean Air Act. One of the things we are doing, in addition to our authorities, as mandated by Congress, is a study of fracking to determine its impacts on drinking water. That is very much in the minds of the American people and, I assume, uh, Congress, is, which is why they asked us to do it. So as we do that study, the other thing we have said, because it is we will not see initial results from that study until the end of next calendar year, uh, is that we will 
uh, when uh, asked or when we become aware of an issue that may be a violation of the Clean Water Act, the Safe Drinking Water Act, or the Clean Air Act, respond, and we will provide guidance on those areas that are becoming areas of concern or challenges for the regulated community as we see our country move into fracking in new areas, such as the Marcellus Shale. But it is not just the contamination of the water, it is the amount, right? I mean, this is a country that is facing water shortages in many areas, correct? Uh, the amount of the volume that is used in this process? That, that is correct, sir. Uh, it takes millions of gallons to frack a well. And what happens is that water is injected. Oftentimes, that is not a regulated activity at the Federal level. But then the water has to come back. It is uh, flowback water. And that water and the disposal of that water, it is an enormous amount of water, as well as it can bring up contamination, such as radiation, in low levels that may be in the formation. That is part of what the study is looking at as well, in addition to quantity. Currently, to the, the limits of your knowledge at this point, what happens to that water that comes back up? Well, a mixture of things. Uh, depending on the area of the country, there are some places where there are just enormous pools where this water is stored and where there is some amount of concern about whether that will be regulated and how those pools will be closed. In other areas, we learned that uh, recent, until recently, when the State of Pennsylvania asked them to voluntarily cease, that producers were sending the water to publicly owned treatment works. That is a regulated activity under the Clean Water Act. And so we have concerns and are working with the State of Pennsylvania to ensure that that is being done according to law and to protect citizens, because those publicly owned treatment works eventually discharge into surface water, which can be drinking water. And in other cases, it is uh, put back down the hole in an in a underground injection disposal or recycled and reused. Thank you. I yield back. Wait, will the gentleman from Illinois, will you yield? Can I ask one, one more yes. follow-up question? Thank you. Uh, going back to Deputy Secretary Hayes, Beverly Gorney, who is a spokeswoman for the Wyoming BLM State Office, who said, said this on April 21st when asked why the BLM pulled six oil and gas drilling leases new, near Adobe Town, Wyoming, quote, they have everything to do with the secretarial order on wildlands, end quote. Was she wrong or right? Uh, I, I don't know the specifics. All I do know is that we have informed uh, everyone in the Department that we are complying with the Congressional rider dealing with wildlands. So there should be absolutely no activity in any way, shape, or form anywhere within the BLM to try to implement the Wildlands Act? No designation of wildlands will occur uh, while that rider is effective, Congressman. And there should be no preliminary work on putting that in place, correct? The, the, the order's focus is on the designation of land as wildlands. Uh, the authority to inventory lands with wilderness characteristics is clearly continuing under the, um, the, Bureau, the uh, Federal Land Management Policy Act. But I repeat, and to your point, we will not designate any lands as wildlands uh, in, uh, in respect and, uh, and compliance with the Congressional direction. Thank you. Thanks to the gentleman from Illinois. Thank you. We now go to the gentleman from Pennsylvania, Mr. Meehan, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Administrator Jackson, thank you for taking the time to appear before us today. I am not aware that we really had an opportunity to speak with you uh, before. In my district of southeastern Pennsylvania, a big issue related to energy relates to refineries. Uh, I have some 7,000 jobs that are tied to the two refineries in my district, which is a good thing because, according to your own report, the number of U.S. refineries has declined by almost half since the 1980s here in the United States, and employment in the refining segments declined by 13 percent in the last decade. Now, most of those refining opportunities have actually moved over to places like India and China and Nigeria, where they are building new refining capacity. In fact, the refineries, as you point to health, and I think that is an appropriate concern, are facing huge regulatory challenges. One of my refineries has spent 20 percent of its total value in regulatory compliance. It is a $5 billion capitalized company that spent $1.3 billion on compliance just in the last recent, recent history. But, and I understand the health, but at what point in time does, while health is an issue with respect to people, at what point in time do the welfare of fish start to take precedence over the creation of jobs 
within one of my refineries, there is now a regulation called uh, clean water, cooling water intake structures under 316B, in which this one refinery is now being asked to put in a cooling tower at the cost of $350 million, the effect of which will be so that they can return the water back to the Delaware River at a 2 percent or 2 degree warmer temperature or cooler temperature, because apparently the fish are thrown off by the warmer water of 2 degrees. The impact of that $350 million additional cost may well put that refinery that employs close to 2,000 people in my district on the line at a point in time where jobs are at stake and at risk of going overseas. Would you please tell me specifically, how does the EPA decide whether the loss or creation of jobs directly as a result of a regulation should be part of a thorough economic analysis? Sir, thank you. Uh, I would just like to point out that while the number of refineries has declined, refining capacity in this country has actually increased. So uh, we have fewer refineries refining more and more products. But, but so those jobs, the capacity here, but those jobs are going overseas. So tell that to the people in my district. My, my point, sir, is that there, are, there is as much oil running through refineries or more than 20 years ago. So what is actually happening is that technologically they are becoming less employee uh, intensive and yet able to process more oil, and that is not as a result of no, those are, those are EPA regulation. Those are at refineries in the Gulf Coast. I am aware of that. I have refineries that have been operating for 50 years that are struggling to continue to compete. And most of the struggle comes at virtue of the regulations. And I am not arguing with regard to, I am not making that point here today because most of it relates to health. I am talking about the welfare of fish. Well, sir, let me speak to that issue directly. Uh, we recently proposed a rule, it hasn't been final, on intake structures, not only for refineries but for power plants. That rule relies heavily on the States. The States are delegated authorities for implementation of the majority of Clean Water Act permits. So although I don't know the specifics of the permit that has been proffered uh, by You're the State this of is Pennsylvania. You are saying the State of Pennsylvania is responsible for this? Sir, I will double check those facts. But my belief is that uh, having run a State program, States proffer or propose permits based on their analysis of requirements. And I would offer this as well. It is not simply the welfare of um, fish, as you put it, but the ecosystem health that the Clean Water Act uh, intends to restore. And where, so where, where does the ecosystem of the health of the 7,000 jobs in my district come into play? I asked you a specific question, whether the loss or creation of jobs directly as a result of regulation is part of a thorough economic analysis. I need a specific answer because just on May 4th, your deputy uh, assistant, Matthew Stanislaus, specifically said we do not take a look at jobs. So I want to know the answer. Do you directly take a look at jobs? We have done it, sir, although we have not done it in every example. And let me explain a little bit about that. Uh, we do a, an economic analysis. It is mandated by law. We also do it in compliance with executive orders issued by the President Clinton that have survived through three administrations. Because of the times we are in, we have leaned heavily into jobs analysis around the rules that have been proposed under the Obama administration. Uh, the gentleman's time has expired. We now go to, uh, to Mr. Yarmuth, if he is ready for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, welcome. Administrator Jackson and Deputy Secretary Hayes. Uh, I have a question about, um, on the, in, in relation to oil supplies. Is there, uh, to your knowledge, a serious shortage of oil supplies in the world right now? There, there is an increasing world demand for oil, and certainly uh, in this country, I think as the Deputy Secretary uh, said, demand is down over the last year. And isn't it true that domestic production under the Obama administration has actually increased? Yes, Congressman. It, it has. It has uh, increased uh, substantially in the last, and, uh, and oil uh, imports have declined by 7 percent in the last three years. So, in fact, whereas we heard a lot about drill, baby, drill under prior administrations, the actual evidence shows that 
production has expanded under this administration, whereas it, it actually hadn't under the previous administration. That is correct, Congressman. When we are talking about prices at the pump, and there are a lot of contributors to pricing in, in oil companies. I know in my district, my Attorney General, Jack Conway, has on two separate occasions taken on uh, refiners and distributors uh, so that when we talk about gouging and people say, well, is there any evidence of gouging from big oil companies, that is not the only aspect of gas pricing that we need to be concerned about in terms of uh, questionable activities. Is that right? That is correct, uh, Congressman. As you know, Attorney General Holder has a, a task force looking into all of these issues. On the question, I, I, I don't want to belabor oil pricing too much, but I, I did want to get that one point on the record about domestic production. But on another subject that the Administrator and I have talked about a number of, of times, uh, in my state, a state that is a large producer of coal, <clears throat> we are constantly informed by the industry that the EPA, through its actions, is actually um, threatening employment in our state. Uh, there are ads being run now in Kentucky that say uh, there are 18,000 good coal mining jobs in Kentucky and the EPA is threatening those jobs. Uh, Mr. Jackson, would you like to comment on the question of the EPA activity vis-a-vis -vis the coal industry and, and employment? Um, yes, thank you. I, I certainly can't answer for those ads, but I do believe they are misleading. What EPA is doing in Appalachia uh, in particular is addressing the water pollution issues associated with a practice known as mountaintop surface mining, mountaintop mining, mountaintop removal. Uh, mining. And in that practice, because of the way that spoils, the remains of the non-coal portions of the mountaintop are disposed, there are increases in solids in the water that selenium and other metals that um, peer-reviewed science and literature continues to show over and over again are quite problematic for the health of those ecosystems. And because they are headwaters, it can become a problem for communities downstream. EPA has worked under uh, draft guidance that we are uh, about to finalize after uh, rounds of public comment to give clearer guidance to mining companies, to State officials as to how we will implement our, our authorities under the Clean Water Act to try to minimize that pollution. Uh, and in terms of employment, uh, you may not know the figures, but at 30 years ago before mountaintop removal became a widespread practice in Appalachia, uh, there were 55,000 coal mining jobs in Kentucky. And in fact, uh, go from going from 55,000 to 18,000 uh, was not the result of any EPA action, because EPA was largely, until your administration, was largely um, basically apathetic toward that, that process. Uh, one of the things that I am constantly impressed with, with regard to the mountaintop removal issue, is that the citizens of eastern Kentucky uh, come to my office and bring water that they took from wells on their property and so forth and out of their tap, and it is water that no one would want to drink or want their children to drink. And so while I know that there has been a number of um, initiatives before this House and before this committee to uh, basically incapacitate EPA and its ability to protect the citizens of my state and their children. Uh, I would like to say that if House Republicans or if anyone has a problem with our environmental laws, they ought to make, take the initiative to change the law. If they want to move to eliminate the Clean Water Act or the Clean Air Act, they ought to do that instead of taking the cop off the beat, which has been the, uh, the steps that have been recommended by this House. With that, I yield back. Gentlemen's time has expired. We go to the gentleman from Texas, Mr. Farenthold, for five minutes. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. And I, I, I did have a couple of questions. Uh, I would like to start uh, with Administrator Jackson. There, there are a lot of folks in uh, Texas who uh, are kind of getting the impression the EPA has it out for us. Uh, 
you know, we have had a pretty good system in place under the uh, Clinton administration, came up with flex permitting system for various refineries. Uh, under that system, we saw a decrease uh, over a nine-year period of 20, uh, 27 percent in total air emissions. Now the uh, EPA is stepping in saying that that flex permitting system uh, isn't good enough and it's creating all sorts of regulatory problems with the EPA trying to redo what we've been doing pretty well for about 10 years. I kind of subscribed to if it ain't broke, don't fix it. Can you tell me why the EPA is un uh, unhappy with Texas and convince me it's just something more than you guys don't like us very much? No, sir. Uh, I certainly uh, like Texas very much. I have family members there. Uh, uh, let me just uh, go over a couple of things. It was actually the George W. Bush administration that made the determination that the flexible permits in the State of Texas did not comply with the Clean Air Act. And it uh, was then left uh, to us in the Obama administration to try to find a way out of that morass. We have worked with the largest flexible permit holders, and I was just briefed on this yesterday. Uh, and I believe with uh, one notable exception, which we are still working on, uh, we have worked them to a place where their permits are, are now compliant with the Clean Air Act. It took work on their part, uh, and so I want to commend the regulated industry for that. And I think we are in a better place, because where that leaves us is with permits that uh, are enforceable under law, are transparent. Uh, and also that give industry the ability to do their job. All right. And now you all are also looking at, uh, at permitting greenhouse gas uh, emissions under Title V. It seems like the last Congress specifically said uh, we really weren't uh, interested in doing that right now under, uh, under cap and trade. Why are you all pursuing that, considering the, even the last Congress wasn't able to pass that out? Well, two things. First, we are not pursuing cap and trade under the Clean Air Act, and it is my opinion, I have said this before, that we cannot and we will not. Uh, we are uh, pursuing regulation of greenhouse gas emissions under the Clean Air Act because of a Supreme Court decision that uh, essentially found in 2007 that greenhouse gases were covered under the Clean Air Act and that EPA uh, needed to make a determination as to whether or not greenhouse gases caused uh, a threat to public health and welfare, which is the th statutory threshold for action. And I apologize for cutting you off. I have only got a couple minutes, and I wanted to uh, go on to Mr. Hayes for a second and talk about drilling in the Gulf of Mexico. You know, there have been a whole lot of uh, hoopla on that. We are spending a whole lot of time uh, arguing about where the permits are coming out at all and how fast they are coming out and all. But y isn't it true that uh, Mexico has got some drilling going on in the Gulf of Mexico. China is undergoing leases, is issuing leases just right off our coast, uh, basically, uh, in the Gulf of Mexico for various oil companies to drill on Chinese and Mexican lands. Uh, Congressman, uh, Mexico is looking at uh, potential deep water uh, drilling. Uh, the Secretary and I were in Mexico City about a month ago meeting with the Energy Minister, and, and we are actually working with them. Uh, and uh, the President has indicated his interest in applying the same safety standards that we are applying in the United States. And, and, and Cuba as well is, do, is doing it. I don't think we are working as well with Cuba as Mexico. You, Cuba, <laughs> that is a fair, fair point, Congressman. Uh, Cuba apparently is considering um, uh, oil drilling off the coast. Uh, so, would, wouldn't we be better off, rather than spending all this time and money with a complicated permitting process, focusing our efforts on spill response and technologies to train people and uh, get the equipment and knowledge in place? So if there was something that happened, be it in foreign waters or domestic waters, uh, we could respond to it and protect our coast? Wouldn't that be a better use of our time and resources? Congressman, certainly spill response is a very, very important focus, but I think the primary lesson out of the Presidential Commission and other, uh, the National Academy of Engineering is that we have the capacity and should prevent these occur occurrences from happening in the first place. And our, our safety upgrades focus on that, and industry has responded. Industry is able to meet the higher safety standards, and frankly, they have not objected to the higher safety standards. All right. Well, I see I have only got about 10 seconds left. Would the gentleman yield? Absolutely. Earlier you took credit for this high level, the highest level since 2003. Aren't there two truths about that, though? First of all, it takes about five years at best case to get a, a, from a beginning of the process to drilling production. So isn't all the credit for this new peak in the previous administration? Simply you haven't been here long enough for anything you have 
done in the way of new leasing to have any yield? Isn't that absolutely true, that you, not one new lease that you put out is today producing? No, I, would, I would say it differently, Congressman. There has been a lot of focus suggesting the Obama administration has been holding up permits, which are the last, the last event to occur before the production occurs. The fact that it, production has increased demonstrates the fact that we have, in fact, been permitting both onshore and offshore Al, on a regular basis. The time basis. I borrowed has expired. The gentleman from Massachusetts, Mr. Tierney, is recognized for five minutes. Thank you very much. I thank our witnesses for being here. Uh, I know that the Chairman started off by talking about speculation being what he thought was a belief that he wasn't going to uh, debunk. But in fact, uh, as the Chairman said before, you know, we are entitled to our own uh, beliefs or opinions, maybe, but not entitled to our own facts. And I think when you have uh, experts from outside, you have industry officials, you have regulators all understanding uh, that uh, speculation is about $27 on the barrel uh, of oil, it is a serious matter. And this casino of future speculators uh, is perhaps where I hope this hearing would, would have gone. And, I sent a letter to the Chairman asking that he do that, and I hope he does get down to the real business of what is going to make a difference in prices at the pump. Now, looking at this drilling idea, from what I see in the United States Energy Information Administration, uh, they say that uh, if we were to permit the outer continental shelf of the Atlantic and Pacific Coast and the eastern central regions of the Gulf of Mexico, uh, the resulting difference in gas prices at the pump would be about 3 cents by 2030. Uh, that, uh, you know, I have watched prices go up and down about $0.10 cents at the, uh, of, of late on that, so $0.03 cents by the year 2030 seems pretty tiny. Mr. Hayes, uh, do you concur with that finding? Uh, yes, Congressman, and it is due to the simple fact that the United States production uh, cannot uh, affect the global uh, oil price in a meaningful way. Well, I think you know, those experts have said you are absolutely right. There is a glut on current, uh, currently on oil. I think um, the, the CEO of ExxonMobil stated as recently as last month that there is no shortage of supply in the market. Uh, and so I guess increased drilling really wouldn't lower the prices of oil and gas. Is that correct? Th that is correct. Uh, I will say, though, that it is our policy to uh, uh, increase domestic oil and gas production responsibly because it is better to have a barrel produced here in the U.S. than to import it. Well, let's talk about that for a second. Uh, Interior Secretary Salazar just testified in front of the Senate that about 70 percent of the tens of millions of offshore acres currently leased to oil companies are inactive. Uh, that includes about 24 million inactive leased acres in the Gulf of Mexico, uh, where I guess there is an estimated 11.6 billion barrels of oil and 59.2 trillion cubic feet of natural gas that are technically recoverable, and they are going unused. Why is the industry uh, just sitting on those leases, Ms. Mr. Secretary? Um, it is not clear. Uh, we are, the President has indicated an interest in encouraging uh, companies uh, to utilize those leases, and that was the subject of his radio address a week ago uh, Saturday. Well, you know, the Secretary also testified about onshore things. The 57 percent of the leased acres, that is about 22 million acres in total, are not being explored nor developed. So what can the President do, what can the Department do to encourage uh, these companies to start using what they have? Uh, one of the recommendations that the administration has made is to change the lease term of the Mineral Leasing Act of 1920. Now onshore, every lease is leased for a full 10 years. Um, it does not take 10 years to make a decision of whether to invest or not. We would prefer to have that lease term reduced, and thus, if a company does not decides not to invest, have the leases returned so another company that might be more willing to invest will do so. You know, I, I look at this even more, and the Interior Department has a report on oil and gas utilization. So they say about 53 million acres were offered for sale in 2009 under this administration, 53 million acres, uh, 37 million acres, I'm sorry. 2.4 million acres were bid on and sold. It's about 5 percent. Uh, in the Central Gulf, 37 million acres were offered in 2010. Again, in this administration, 37 million acres, 2.4 million acres were bid on and sold. That's about 6.5 percent. Can you explain why these companies aren't bidding on those leases and that we have to listen to drill, baby, drill, and this administration won't uh, this and won't that in terms of take 5 percent in one instance, 6.5 percent in the other? What is the explanation for that? I can't explain why companies are not bidding. I think our primary point, Congressman, is that our administration is providing the opportunity, a robust opportunity, for domestic oil and gas production, and I think those numbers make that point. Well, according to the EIA administrator, there are already open to Federal and gas leasing about 95 percent of the technically recoverable oil and gas on the outer continental shelf. Is that right? 
I, I, I'm not familiar with the exact report, but I assume so. Well, I, I guess I'm having some difficulty understanding why the oil and gas industry believes they don't have enough of the taxpayers' land to, to work on already, given those numbers. Let me ask you this. What more can we do about speculation? That seems to be the real problem and, and the one that I hope this Chairman will have a hearing on. If it is $27 or $30 dollars, uh, of every barrel, what can we do and what ought we be doing about really focusing on the real problem? Well, Congressman, as you know, the President has indicated a strong interest in addressing this issue and, and, and has asked the Attorney General to set up a special tri st strike force to investigate uh, potential speculation, and I know that uh, that, uh, that group is un underway. All right. Thank you. Sorry, that was not for you. The gentleman from Tennessee, Dr. Desjale. Good morning, Administrator Jackson and Deputy Secretary Hayes. I really appreciate your being here today. There are an awful lot of folks in Tennessee Ford that were obviously excited about you being here as well because I actually had several calls back from the district and we have questions that were sent in on Facebook and other mediums to uh, ask you. So uh, we do really appreciate you being here. Uh, one of the reasons I was sent to Congress was to help create jobs. And as part of our oversight committee, I have traveled Tennessee's 4th District over the past several months visiting businesses and industries and asking them what is standing in the way of job growth. And almost unanimously, uh, the, the number one thing that people were telling me was to get government out of the way. And not surprisingly, uh, Administrator Jackson, the EPA often comes up that uh, they feel that there are burdensome regulations that are preventing job creation. Now, uh, when, when we started here earlier today, the ranking member uh, cited the Gulf oil spill, which was obviously very tragic, and he said that it was our job and your job to never, ever, ever, never, never, ever allow that to happen again. Do you feel if you had unlimited uh, power and resources that you could prevent that from never, ever happening again? No, sir, I can't guarantee that. Okay. Well, how, how good are you guys? Because there is an awful lot of uh, power and, and uh, uh, rules and regulations that are being levied on our businesses here that seem to be prohibiting job growth. Uh, do, you, do you feel like the EPA is doing a good job? In general, yes. One, one of the reasons I don't believe I could guarantee that is because EPA does not primarily regulate the safety of offshore drilling. So there is nothing within EPA's authority that speaks to whether or not those rigs are safe. I think the Deputy Secretary has spoken to that this morning. Well, just out of curiosity, because we had uh, Secretary of Labor here on an earlier hearing, and, and they were citing the mining accident in West Virginia that took so many lives, and I had asked uh, over the past 10 years if they could show me an improved safety record because of their inspections and the fines that they levy, because they do go into these uh, mines. and and levy fines for any number of things. And then when they leave, I assume that they are satisfied that the mine is safe, but then there is a disaster, and uh, it is always the mine's fault. It is not the MSHA's fault. If there is a disaster uh, within the environment, does the EPA take responsibility? Do they feel accountable for that? No. In general in this country, the belief is that the polluter is responsible, and it is the job of the regulatory agency to set the the rules of the game, if you will, and to enforce them so there is a level playing field. Sir. Okay. Well, I get the impression from the folks that I am talking to <coughs> excuse me, that if you are going to wield that much power, then maybe you ought to take some responsibility as well. So that is just the opinion that I get. But <coughs> the uh, folks that are engaged in calling in, I did want to get a couple of questions in. The Oversight Committee Chairman reads our mission state statement before each hearing. And our goal is to work with citizen watchdogs to deliver more efficient, effective government that works for taxpayers, businesses, and their families. Many Americans are concerned that the EPA's mission seems to be pitted against efficiency and effectiveness. We invited you here today, and we will invite you back, to give you a chance to show the taxpayers otherwise. This is your chance. Ellen Weatherill, one of our citizen watchdogs from Facebook wants to know, is the goal of the EPA to protect the environment or to drive up fuel costs in order to force Americans to modify their behavior? Our mission is to protect human health and the environment, sir. Okay. I hope she is satisfied with that answer. Uh, not only does EPA regulation attempt to enact a cap-and-trade scheme that couldn't even pass both Democrat-controlled houses of Congress, preventing the private sector from creating good jobs, 
but no u s cap and trade plan would solve the massive pollution generated by growing industrial countries this fact is not lost on america citizen watchdog gary de long from facebook wants to know why is cap and trade viable when in a few short years india and china will produce significantly more air pollution and cannot and will not be held accountable despite anything done by america mister well please assure your constituent that epa is not implementing a cap and trade program but uh, you might also, and I am happy to speak to him as well, uh, mention to him that uh, market-based programs have been used successfully in this country to control other pollutants such as SO2, the prime contributor to acid rain. Okay, I want to get in one more. I am trying to help these folks okay. out. Um, <laughs> Citizen watchdog Melody McMahon Warbington from Facebook wants to know, why do we support the subsidizing of drilling in Brazil and hamstring our companies here at home? Um, I, I do not know that we support the subsidizing of drilling in Brazil. That is outside my area of expertise. The and President mentioned that uh, that was he was looking forward to being a major importer. And I am about out of time, so I will go ahead and yield back. Thank you for answering those questions. I thank the gentleman. We now go to the gentleman from Northern Virginia, Mr. Connolly, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, welcome both to Ms. Jackson and Mr. Hayes. Um, I, I assume, by the way, picking up on that last question, Administrator Jackson, your silence, your, you ran out of time. You weren't conceding that EPA hamstrings production domestically. Absolutely not, sir. Right. No. And, I, and I assume from your previous answer in terms of the mission of EPA, neither were you implying or allowing the inference to be drawn that the choice you were presented is, in fact, the choice. I mean, surely we can both drill and produce and do it in an environmentally safe way. It is a false choice to say it is one or the other. I would think. What do you think? It is indeed a false choice. And in terms of responsibility for our actions, I would point out to Dr. Desjardins that, uh, that EPA is responsible for the fact that air pollution is down 60 percent in this country over 40 years, while our GDP has gone up 207 percent. So by that metric, I think we are, are effectively delivering for the American people. You know, uh, listening to my friends sometimes on the other side of the aisle, they want the narrative to be that this administration is so environmentally conscious that it has hamstrung the ability of domestic producers, both in oil and gas, to produce. So, uh, Deputy Secretary Hayes, I just wonder if I could run through some statistics with you and have you confirm or correct them. My understanding is that actually in the Bush administration, production, domestic production actually fell from 7.6 million barrels per day to 6.7 million. Is that correct? I don't have those numbers uh, handy, but I will uh, certainly be happy to confirm that, Congressman. And conversely, under the Obama administration, production actually increased. It went from 6.7 million to 7.5 million, essentially reversing the 1 million barrels per day loss that occurred in the Bush administration. That is correct, that uh, production has increased uh, during the Obama administration. Now, uh, we heard the chairman, for example, which I, I, I want to uh, applaud him for pointing out, that there is a time lag between the issuance of permits and the actual bringing on of product to the market, something many on our side of the aisle have actually been trying to point out to our friends on the other side of the aisle when they say drill here, drill now allowing the impression with the public that somehow it is magically going to change the price of oil, and of course it isn't. However, dealing with uh, permit applications, it is my understanding that in the last year of the Bush administration there were 5,000 uh, applications listed, and under the Obama administration last year that went from 5,000 to 7,200. So the permit applications actually went up significantly. Is that correct? I think you are referring to the uh, applications for permits to drill on BLM lands. That is right. And, and correct. Uh, the applications have gone up, and we have actually, uh, there was a significant backlog um, that we have, we have uh, cut down significantly in the last two years. Now, also part of this narrative is that President Obama has just called, caused an absolute moratorium after the worst deep water oil spill in American history. Uh, and that there is this de facto moratorium on Gulf Coast oil drilling. Now, it is my understanding that actually uh, outer continental shelf production has increased from 446 million barrels in 2008 to 600 million barrels last year. Is that correct? 
That is correct. So much for a moratorium. Um, switching subjects just a little bit, Ms. Jackson, uh, there is a lot of talk and promise about hydraulic fracturing. Um, is there any evidence that hydraulic fracturing, however, can affect aquifers and water supplies? Um, there is evidence that uh, it can certainly affect them. Uh, I am not aware of any proven case where the fracking process itself has affected water, although there are investigations ongoing and concerns about What them. kinds of chemicals are we concerned about in terms of possible pollutants to water supply? Well, you know, the, the actual fracking process. The contaminants are not public in terms of their mixtures, but we do know that they include things like benzene and toluene, ethylbenzene, xylene, uh, compounds like that. And what is the problem with those chemicals? Well, those are listed hazardous waste primarily because uh, for most of them it is the effect on the central nervous system, uh, either to a baby in utero, meaning uh, birth defects or problems uh, with the nervous system, developmental dis uh, disorders uh, primarily. Benzene carcinogen? It is indeed, sir. Thank you. And final question, uh, the Marcellus Shale formation that we are looking at, is it near any major urban water supplies? You can answer that briefly. Time is up. Uh, yes, y yes, sir. Um, uh, New York City is concerned about it. Obviously, it is upstream even of Washington, D.C. supply. Thank you. My time is up, Mr. Thank Chairman. You. Thank you for your courage. The gentleman from North Carolina, Mr. McHenry, for five thank, minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I certainly appreciate it. Now, there's just been this discussion that, um, you know, with with restricting access to uh, domestic oil supplies, that um, when policymakers on Capitol Hill are trying to open up a greater amount of supply here in the United States, that somehow that's supportive of, of big oil. But really, the, the economic reality is is counter to that. The economic reality is that. When you open up a greater amount of supply, it is a small guy that benefits. It is a small business owner. It is a small trucking firm. It is the mom taking the kids to school. Um, it is it's the small guy that benefits when we have more production, greater supply, which will lower the cost. And those two things are, are inextricably linked. Now, when we restrict supply, like administration policy, especially this administration's policies have been, that increases the profits for the big oil companies because they have a smaller quantity of precious resource to, to access, and therefore they can charge more at the pumps. It seems to me that the, the rhetoric coming out of this administration, while they are saying they are increasing supply, is is run counter to that, the, the restrictions, the higher regulations. The, um, in, in, you know, we all care about clean water and clean air, but we also want to be able to drive our kids to school. We also want to be able to have a job to go to so that we can make the mortgage payment, so we can provide for our families. And it seems like th that this President, this administration simply does not get it. And with that, I yield the balance of my time to the Chairman. I thank the gentleman. Mr. Secretary, uh, on your website, the BLM website, and I quote, it says, uh, BLM are, are working with local communities, state regulators and industry and other Federal agencies in building a clean energy future by providing sites for environmentally sound development of renewable energy on public lands. Are you familiar with that? Yes, sir. Why is it I can't, and it goes on about solar and wind, I can't find anything about BLM represents the, the greatest amount of resources of natural gas and, and oil of any landowner, and, uh, and in fact, it is the second largest revenue to the U.S. Treasury. Why is it that what we are talking about here today, the access to Federal lands, which I know you are saying it is going up, our figures and our studies show maybe not so much. Why is it isn't anywhere on your website? Are you not proud of the availability of BLM land for natural resource uh, exploration and, de and development and delivery? We are absolutely proud of it, uh, Congressman and uh, Mr. Chairman. Well, why is it not on your website? Well, it is probably more importantly in our budget. We are spending uh, at least 80 percent of our uh, BLM budget on conventional oil and gas compared to renewable uh, energy. Well, that is because that is what pays. The revenue that, you're, that the taxpayers are receiving far exceeds uh, your budget, and it is coming from oil and natural gas. It is not coming from windmills. 
No, we, we, are, we are proud of, of both things, uh, Mr. Chairman. We are proud of the fact that until this administration, there was no large-scale renewable development on the public lands, and we have responded to the market demand, particularly in California, and have provided siting opportunities for thousands of megawatts of utility-scale solar. We are proud of that. But we look forward to seeing if those sightings actually uh, turn into production in California. So far, we are not doing so well uh, as a California has been watching our attempt to get to the 2020 plan. Um, earlier, the uh, uh, ranking member was, was talking about various figures. I have got one that concerns me. EIA, earlier recognized uh, as an authority, has downgraded production in the Gulf of Mexico by 250 barrels per day over the each or 250,000 barrels per day for each of the next two years. Are you concerned about that precipitous drop in production in the Gulf? I, I should say, Mr. Chairman, there is no question that because of the Deepwater Horizon disaster, the oil spill, and the need to upgrade our safety standards, which the Congress, presidential commissions, and others agreed needed to happen. That there has okay, been, but, but there, just there, to, to, to weigh in, there here, is, hasn't a federal judge said that your moratorium was wrong? And after after that was forced to be lifted by federal action, didn't you then go to Alaska and do the same thing, uh, so that it requires federal action again? No, no sir. Uh, as a federal judge in Alaska confirmed, there was no moratorium in Alaska. Well, let's let's talk about the Gulf. You had to be ordered to undo a, a moratorium that was overly broad and, and held it. No, uh, well, we just, no, sir. We will we'll consider the record. I don't want to have you say anything that ultimately would be bad, considering you are under oath. Uh, with that, we go to, uh, oh, to the general lady from, if you're the general lady from California, uh, Ms. Speer, for five minutes. Mr. Chairman, if I might, just a, a personal point of privilege, if you are going to make an assertion uh, that a witness may not be telling the truth, the least you could do as a matter of decency is allow him to respond to the gentleman on that. I cut him off because, in fact, the, court, the record of the court action speaks for itself. And if he is going to say that somehow they, uh, what they were ordered as unreasonable and overly broad isn't part of the problem, I didn't want to have, have him go any further in that. He is an quite, adult and he is quite conscious. If you want to cut somebody the, off, the gentleman is no longer recognized. The gentlelady from California, it is your time. The fairness Mr. is a concept. We the, hope this the gentlelady controls the time. The gentle point of order, Mr. Chairman. The, time. Mr. Chairman, the gentlelady has to respect the point of order. Thank For you, Mr. State Chairman. your point of order. Mr. Chairman, you basically implied that this gentleman may be lying. No, I did not. Uh, yes, you did. The gentleman and, has, has and stated his point of order. I think that you should give him an opportunity to answer the question. I mean, this is, let, let me tell you something. This, the, the is, this is about the integrity the of this complete, committee. The gentlelady's time is and, now and, running. And, I'm not, and I said it from the beginning, I am not going to allow people to come in here to be called all kinds of things and not being treated fairly. Now, this man has to go home. He has got people watching this. And I ask you to give him an answer, give him an opportunity to answer the question you asked him. It is not a point of order. The gentlelady's time is running. Mr. Chairman, uh, Mr. Hayes, would you like to continue your comments, please? Uh, thank you, Congresswoman. Um, the moratorium was lifted on October 10 uh, by the Secretary of the Interior uh, after a series of public meetings in which we concluded that the basis for the moratorium uh, were satisfied. Uh, and, uh, and as the Chairman said, the litigation record speaks for itself. Do you have anything further to say? No, thank you. All right. Um, it, you know, for all the talk about expanding the drilling opportunities in this country, if we were to do everything in the fantasies of every oil executive's mind, we are still looking at oil production that wouldn't be online until 2020, 2030. Is that correct? Uh, certainly, some some oil production is is in the out years. And having that that oil drilled would actually have the effect of lowering the cost of gas at the pump by one percent. Is that correct? The the EIA study uh, indicated uh, that was quoted uh, earlier suggested that. So for all this hyperbole going on in this hearing room today. It would suggest that if we allowed every CEO of every oil company in this country to drill everywhere they wanted to drill, that the most that consumers would see 
would be in my state, which is about $4 a gallon, a $0.04 cent reduction, and that would be in out years. It wouldn't be this year. It wouldn't be this month. It wouldn't be tomorrow. Correct? That is correct, Congresswoman, and that is why the President has focused on the importance of looking forward and having a, an energy economy that doesn't just focus on oil and gas production domestically, although we will focus on that, but also focuses on efficiency, alternative fuels, and a clean energy future. So I had the, um, the uh, I guess, audacity when I first got elected to Congress to introduce my very first bill, which was to lower the national speed limit in this country by five miles, except in rural areas. So in rural areas, it could continue to be at the higher speed, but lower it to 65 in other areas. It would, if I am recalling correctly, reduce the actual cost of gas to the consumers today as much as 40 or 50 cents on the gallon. Is that true? I am not familiar. I know that going slower uh, saves gas. And I have also, if I recall correctly, it would save maybe three to 4,000 lives a year. Is that correct? It sounds, uh, sounds plausible, and I defer to Administrator Jackson, who says yes. Ms. Jackson, would you like to respond? Well, I can certainly respond on the, uh, on the savings. One easy way for people to save money is by slowing down. On EPA's website, there is a page that talks about things you can do, including maintenance on your car, the speed you drive, how you drive. That can actually have a total effect, if I am recalling correctly, of around 50 or so cents a gallon. All right. Um, Mr. Mr. Chairman, I would like to submit for the record a letter signed by uh, 54 of my colleagues and myself um, asking both um, Attorney General Holder and um, Mr. Uh, Chairman Gensler to immediately start an investigation of price speculation. I don't necessarily think we need a strike force or a study or another evaluation. I think it is time for an investigation. I would like to submit this for the record. Without objection, so ordered. And let me just see if uh, there's any other questions I might. I guess I'd like to have uh, Mr. Hayes speak to us about um, what is being done to streamline the royalty process. Uh, thank you for asking that question. Um, we have had a very vigorous uh, reform effort on the royalty collection side. This is uh, an area that has been of special interest to the chairman. I appreciate his leadership in this area. Two, two, two main uh, reforms. Number one, we eliminated the royalty in kind program that we believed uh, pot provided potential abuse in terms of uh, non-transparent collection of royalties. And then secondly, uh, we are announcing today uh, a, uh, an initiative on royalty simplification. Uh, we are asking for comment on a proposal that would involve using market-based pricing to, uh, uh, for the basis of royalty calculations, rather than the current system that looks at transaction by transaction, case by case evaluation of transportation and processing costs, uh, a lot more potential for expense by industry and the agency and also potential abuse. So we are announcing that today. Thank you. The gentlelady's time has expired. The gentleman from Pennsylvania, Mr. Kelly, for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Ms. Jackson and, and also Mr. Hayes, thanks for being here today. I know that it is not always comfortable to sit here and, and try to answer questions that we throw at you. But coming from Western Pennsylvania, where Marcellus Shale is an, obviously a great opportunity for Pennsylvania and for the country. My concern is right now DEP is sitting on a lot of permitting, and the, the big question is the water, the fracking water. Now, fracking is 60 years old. It is not new. We know that Marcellus Shale is five to 7,000 feet below the surface. It really doesn't affect some of the water tables in the aquifers. However, I know there is a question about wastewater and what happens with it. A lot of that has to do with DEP approved regulations for wastewater people that do the treating on it, and they make a lot of money doing that. If you were to check DEP, all the uh, rivers in Western Pennsylvania, everybody is right at where they should be. There has been no substantial change in it. My question is why all of a sudden is the EPA interested in what is happening in Pennsylvania with the DEP? Because there really isn't an instance there to question, has there been any water contamination? Or am I wrong on that? Um, I am not aware of any uh, water contamination associated with the recent drill drilling. There have certainly been issues I am aware of in 
uh, Western Pennsylvania around surface water contamination and, and other uh, issues like mining, especially uh, in West Virginia on the Mon Monongahela. Um, EPA is involved for two reasons, sir. One, because the State is a delegated authority under the Clean Water Act. They run most aspects of the water program in Pennsylvania, but not all. For example, EPA runs the industrial pretreatment program in the State of Pennsylvania, which is the program that regulates what drillers are allowed to send to wastewater treatment plants. So it is a shared jurisdiction, although uh, my understanding is that the staff are working together and that EPA staff in general believe that the State should be a frontline agency. But they haven't found any examples of any, any real dangers right now, and they are working well within DEP regulations. It is just all of a sudden EPA is involved. And I have got to tell you, when I am back home in the district, the EPA doesn't really sit well with a lot of those folks, and it is about job creation. It is about opportunity. We are really looking at things that are kind of crazy. And I noticed today that the talk is about are we getting gouged? Are we getting gouged? And I, I think most of what go to oil. But nobody questions gold and silver commodities and that, why they are rising in prices. Are we getting gouged there? I think a little bit is disingenuous as to, as to what it is that we are trying to regulate, who makes too much money, who is making too much money, and, and, and such and such. We do have a tendency to demonize others, and we really don't get to the, to the problems that are at hand. I will tell you this. At 416 in MCF, and that is on NYMEX, uh, on natural gas futures right now, there is a great opportunity. It is a great buy right now. Uh, I know permits are, are available, but I got to tell you, for investors, it is the uncertainty of what is happening with regulation that keeps people from going forward. And I think we all know that, because the only people that don't worry about a positive return on, on investment is the U.S. government. All the rest of us really are driven by the fact that we actually have to have a positive return on it. And I understand why we have regulation, so that is fine. But I, I do want to ask you this. The, the, the NPDES, or the National Pollutant Discharge uh, Elimination System, right now, Backlog in their office. PA, DEP has sent 75 draft permits to the EPA Phillies re Region Office. Okay? As of May 2, 22 permits have been issued. 53 are pending some sort of review. According to DEP, EPA's intervention has increased DEP's workload and has extended an already lengthy, burdensome process. So, what is the end game, and how can we speed up this permitting? Well, sir, we are, we are happy to work with the State to ensure efficient. Uh oversight and review of permits. I am not aware of exactly which permits you are referring to. Let, let me simply say to you and your constituents, as EPA Administrator, I see the incredible potential in natural gas. I think it is important for our country, and I look at it through the lens of my job and duties, which is its potential to decrease pollution. So the only thing that uh, I see as our job is to work with the State, with regulators, with communities to respond to their concerns, because public acceptance of safe and responsible uh, exploitation of this resource in the good way, exploitation yeah. in a good way, yeah. is key to having it happen. And, and I have attended our... some of those meetings. Excuse me for interrupting. I have attended some of those meetings. There is a very highly motivated and very, uh, and very mobile group that show up at these different communities meeting, meetings. It isn't always the people that live in those communities. They are highly motivated, they are highly organized, and they are very vocal. They are addressing problems that really don't exist right now. And in fact, if you were to go back and look at what Mr. Crancier says and other people in Pennsylvania, they are more concerned with facts than they are with fear. But what it is doing, it is driving a market perception or a public perception out there that Marcellus is dangerous and is affecting drinking water, and it simply is not true. And with that, I yield back my time, Mr. Chairman. I thank the gentleman. We now go to the gentleman from Florida, Mr. Mack, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, and also want to thank uh, the witnesses for being here today. And, uh, and I, I know it can be uh, uh, uncomfortable and difficult at times, and, and we do respect and uh, value your time for being here. That being said, uh-oh. Um, I listened to, um, Mr. Hayes, I listened to your, your opening statement, opening testimony, and I got to tell you that if, uh, I'm, I am positive that there, if there are people in my district who listen to that, uh, they would be uh, quite angry. Uh, because in your statement, basically what you said uh, is that everything is so rosy uh, and, and it is really the oil company's fault. Uh, they have the potential to drill, they are just not doing it. They have the potential to drill for oil and natural gas, they are just not doing it. No one believes that. Absolutely no one believes that. Now, you can get 
creative in the way that you present the information, uh, and you can um, sugarcoat it and present it in a way that may support your position, but no one believes it. Uh, let me ask you this question. You keep talking about um, that uh, under the current administration there is more opportunities to drill, more leases, all that kind of stuff. So um, would you say that in the, uh, on average the Obama administration has uh, had more leases or less leases than the Bush administration? Uh, I don't uh, have the exact number of leases. I know that in terms of the number of acres uh, that have been leased, um, that, that the numbers are quite similar, uh, both administrations. So on average, in a year, between the Obama administration and the Bush administration, the average acres is similar? Uh, that is certainly true. I believe, Congressman, I want to check the numbers, but it is certainly true in the offshore. Um, well, let, let me just let me just sh tell you the figures that I have. Sure. Uh, under the Obama administration, the average acres leased per year is 1.63 million. Under the Bush administration, it's 3.66 million. I don't I don't think those are close. But that being said, again, I think that just points to the fact that on one hand you're taking credit for the past administration's work. Uh, and, and, then on the, and then on the other hand, you are saying that it is the oil company's fault, no. that, they haven't, that they haven't drilled or they haven't done what they need to do, that all, somehow there is this, all, of this, all of this acres out there for them to drill and that they own leases to and they are ready to go, but they just haven't done it. No. Isn't that I, not true? You know, if I can please explain. Uh, thank you for, for raising this issue. Uh, the primary reason why we are laying out these facts on how much acreage has been made available and how many permits we have processed is to respond to the argument that our administration somehow has inappropriately restricted the areas for oil and gas leasing and that we have been the cause for what is perceived to be, but is not in fact the case, a decline in domestic oil and gas production. Um, with regard to uh, what, what the, the reasons why oil companies and gas companies may or may not drill, uh, that is largely a business uh, issue. Let me, uh, I will note uh, that, hold, will hold note on, that the on, price of my time, my time is limited, so let me ask okay, you this. Certainly. Does the oil companies have the ability to go find where the oil reserves are, apply for a lease uh, and a permit to drill in that area, or is it the administration sets the areas in which they can explore to see if there is any oil? Which one of the two? Uh, it varies. In the offshore, traditionally the entire uh, central and western Gulf have been made available Isn't for it true, though, that there are areas in which are available for exploration of oil and there are some areas that are off limits. In other words, in other words, certainly. If, so, so certainly. here's my point. If you say to the oil companies that if you basically if you offer them crap, you get crap, oh, I, and that is just the way it is. If you say to them you can drill in these areas that there is no oil to drill for, and then blame them for not drilling, oh, yeah. that is, that is the problem, and that is the picture that you are painting. That is what people back home are hearing. It is why they are frustrated with government. The gentleman's time has expired. The gentleman from Oklahoma, Mr. Can Langford, is recognized respond, for five Mr. minutes. Uh, if you want to respond, I didn't, I didn't see your question there, but if you have a response, please. <laughs> I would just like to make the point that there are certain areas that we believe are not appropriate for drilling, uh, uh, very close to national parks, for example, other sensitive areas. Uh, but the fact that we have 40 million acres onshore, uh, many of which is, are in prime oil and gas territory, Wyoming, Utah, et cetera, areas with history and infrastructure suggests, and, and the Gulf experience suggests that we are offering industry uh, prime areas for production. Thank you. I thank the gentleman, Mr. Langford. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. 
this is one of these areas apparently we are not going to solve today. I, I would like to request, uh, Deputy Secretary Hayes, that you would sit down with some of the folks from oil companies and we try to resolve this together at a table and that we have a hearing saying we don't understand why these companies aren't drilling in these areas and what the permit and the process. It might be a very informative conversation for us to get everybody together and uh, I'll get under oath and I'll start trying to talk this out and be able to resolve it and, uh, and get everybody together. Would you be open to that kind of conversation? We would be delighted to do that. We, we have had a number of conversations in the Interior Department with CEOs of oil companies right, right along and, in fact, the President's suggestions on how to facilitate more production have come out of the kinds of discussions we have had with you, CEOs. You have mentioned several times about production uh, being at this highest level since 2003. Can you name a specific action that Interior or EPA took in 2008 and 2009 to give us this large production in 2010? Which specific action would you point to and say, because we did that in 2008 and 2009, now we have this great production? Um, I, I think I can point to probably thousands of actions. Um, the fact that we processed um, at least more than 5,000 APDs uh, in uh, that's e for, each that's for, So e those came online within a year and they were out uh, producing right away? Typically they do, yes. Typically those are the onshore productions See, that come it, it online. Seemed, it seems to be, to me, the market has driven this. When oil went to about $100 a barrel, it is amazing how much production suddenly occurred. And it seems to be that Interior is taking credit for 100 bucks a barrel, what really happened with the market drove that up. No, that is a very fair point, Congressman. Okay. Well, see, that, that, that's what, it, it just frustrating to me to keep hearing, you know, we have got this great sure. production, we have got this great production we didn't have in the Bush administration. We have $100 a barrel of oil. Every marginal well that is out there is now right. pumping oil. And we seem to be confusing apples and oranges here. When we start talking about production, our production is at an all-time high. Production is not the, not the issue at this point. Great, I am glad we have production, but a lot of those are marginal wells, those are other wells that are already drilled. We need to talk about future exploration. Right. And a lot of this conversation seems to be future exploration. We are talking about you are responding with production. And uh, so that is two different things in that. We, we need to talk about what, hap what happens five years from now, ten years from now, what is coming online with that. Let, let me ask a question of both of you on this. Uh, the President put out Executive Order 13563, which deals with uh, regulation and regulatory review, looking backwards on it. Were both of your agencies, have you already submitted your paperwork for that? Because uh, that should be coming out in the next week and a half, those public documents, this preliminary. Both of you have those uh, reviews complete? E EPA has, sir. Yes. Great. Yes. Terrific. Look forward to getting a chance to go through that. A major part of that statement, which was a great statement from the President, was talking about all of our regulations need to promote predictability and reduce uncertainty in our regulatory environment. Uh, if there is any area that I can tell you from energy uh, companies that I talk to and I interact with in my district, it is this sense of uncertainty. We don't know what the regulations are going to be. The rumors run wild. And while you can say we haven't done that, there is the perception. Let me give you, for instance, and um, uh, Administrator Jackson, you have mentioned multiple times about natural gas. It is terrific. But if you talk to natural gas companies, they have no idea what is happening in this frac study. And there is a large sense of founded fear that natural gas fracking is about to be crushed, and they can't seem to find any response back on it. Since 1949 in Oklahoma, we have been doing natural gas fracking and, and oil fracking. Uh, this is a long-term use process, and I would invite anyone to come to Oklahoma and drink our water and look at our beautiful land and breathe our air and see it as a terrific state. And as you had mentioned before, uh, the, the State's preference to perf uh, permits seems to be being pulled back somewhat, and it is creating this sense of uncertainty in it. Um, my colleague, Mr. Meehan, earlier mentioned about the 316B permits, and you deferred that immediately to the States and said that is a State issue. I can tell you in my State, for the energy companies in my State, they are struggling with EPA right now over 316B because there are minnow, there are bait minnows being killed in one of their cooling ponds, and they are being pushed towards creating a cooling tower costing millions of dollars, which will be passed under, uh, onto ratepayers for their own cooling pond. It is not creating certainty in what prices are going to be, where they can invest, and what they can do. So, in, and on the other side of that, dealing with the State preference it is not consistent with the actual actions on the field in dealing with 316B, with regional uh, haze uh, requirements. Uh, my own State has put up a proposal for dealing with regional haze. It is being rejected by EPA. And so those dynamics don't practice out in real life. It is coming out in your testimony, but in real life examples in my district and in my State, those things don't actually occur. So have a significant, um, I guess, issue uh, with some of your testimony and what is actually happening on the field. 
Uh, well, sir, I am happy to answer some of those uh, factually. First, with respect to the natural gas companies and their concerns about the uh, study, which, again, was asked for uh, by Congress. They asked us to do it. Uh, that study has been publicly scoped. We had several listening sessions and meetings and hearings to hear input on how the study should be scoped. We have gone through peer review of the scope of the study in a very public forum to do it. In fact, the scope is not yet set for that very reason. Uh, so I'm, I'm uh, perplexed as to how they could not know what this study is about, because we have gone to great pains to make it a very transparent process. It, it's the gentleman's perfect. time has expired. I, I, yeah. I apologize. That is fine. Uh, and I know you, you can answer for the record, if you don't mind. I realize there's a, he had a, had a lot of good questions there. The gentlelady from the District of Columbia, Ms. Holmes Norton, is recognized for five minutes. Well, some of us uh, value the the seafood from the Gulf region think it is the very best. So I am particularly interested in uh, the effect of the Gulf, the oil spill on that part of the economy, which I understand is almost half of the economy, a million jobs or so. Uh, in your view, has the uh, tourism industry, for example, uh, fully recovered uh, from the uh, oil, oil spill? I think as we enter this summer season, we will find out. Uh, so far, I hear bookings are up. I think if you speak to business owners along the coast, though, they feel as though last summer uh, put them, because things were so depressed, last summer has put them in a place where they may never be able to recoup those losses, and some businesses are still potentially marginal. Uh, what has the effect, when you see these, uh, these uh, uh, merchants who used to go out uh, for lobsters and the rest on, on TV, you, you hear a kind of pessimism in them, uh, a sense that, that um, the rest of the country thinks they are not recovered, that um, they may never get back to where they were. What is the continuing effect of the oil spill? Uh, regarding the safety of that seafood uh, around the country? Um, the the uh, seafood in the Gulf has been tested, is uh, widely tested, and FDA and NOAA both agree that seafood is safe. Uh, the Gulf fishermen and shrimpers still struggle with uh, a bit of a stigma, and of course the most recent uh, issue that is affecting their livelihood is the horrible flooding throughout our country. Uh, that has in, meant a lot of fresh water in their oyster beds, which may threaten them. It has nothing to do with the spill, but is certainly another, another blow to their, their livelihood. Well, poor Louisiana, they got two big industries, one is seafood and the other is oil, uh, all in the same spot. Um, would the gentlelady yield for just a second? I will be glad to, Mr. Uh, Chairman. Just so you know in advance, next Thursday we will be having a hearing as a result of all our trips to the Gulf. So we will provide you with additional information that is going to be very focused on the uh, plight of the Gulf. Um, that is very important to know because I think we need some statistics on, you know, are they selling as much in seafood? Are people coming to this great tourist uh, region as much as possible? Um, do you think, let's look at the oil industry, uh, the other part of that economy, do you think that the oil spill uh, has, uh, because of its mammoth um, nature, has damaged the reputation of the oil industry uh, in, the, in the Gulf or as a whole? Have they recovered? If I can speak to that. Um uh, I think the oil industry has shown significant resilience and and uh, commitment to meet the higher safety uh, and environmental requirements that were put in place after the um, the Gulf uh, disaster and um, uh, and uh, is committed for the long term uh, to continue to uh, develop uh, the. Uh, but what about its reputation right. in, in that area? Is this industry trusted? Uh, once again, I can't speak to that. Perhaps, uh, Mr. Chairman, I hope that, that when you say ne next, the, the next hearing, we'll have some sense of these two industries, how they are perceived in the region and how they are perceived in, in the country, since we have this uh, anomaly that these two industries dominate 
the uh, Gulf Co Coast, and we, 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 we need some perception of what the biggest oil spill loss of 11 lives uh, yeah, and, in our history we, is. And we will send you an advance memo before the end of the week so that you can have additional input to it. Appreciate that, Mr. Chairman. I yield back the remainder of my oh, I yield to the, to the, to the uh, ranking members. Just one question. Thank you, the gentlelady, for yielding. Uh, Chairman Issa and the oil industry lobbying groups have asserted that the administrator inten administration intentionally delayed the permitting process to discourage offshore drilling. Mr. Hayes, can you just address that concern directly? Did you or the current administration intentionally delay any permits in order to discourage offshore drilling? No, sir, we did not. I see my time is up. The gentleman from Florida, Mr. Ross, is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, uh, Ms. Jackson, thank you very much for being here. I appreciate your testimony. It is an opportunity for me, being from Central Florida, where we have uh, quite an involvement of the EPA. We have a uh, phosphate industry, a lot of agricultural industry. Um, and, and, and to ask a self-serving question, uh, we have had some situations where EPA has been there, of course, doing radon studies, flyovers, and my office has tried to get some cooperation and find out what is going on. So I would just ask you personally if you will cooperate with me so that I might respond to my constituents back home as to what is going on with regard to EPA's investigation not only of radon but also of water quality studies. Sir, I am happy to meet with you or to get you whatever information you, you are looking for. Thank you. Uh, the other thing I want to talk to you about briefly is I notice in your bio you talk about um, uh, that, that you and your staff and more than 17,000 professionals are working across the nation to usher in a green economy. And I think that is pretty important as we are talking about oil and gas exploration, our dependence on such and the production of such in this, from within our domestic uh, borders. Uh, but more importantly to me is that if we are going to usher in a green economy, it has been my feeling that we need to do so uh, by way of competition, market forces as opposed to mandates, meaning that I don't think that it is appropriate that we force a green economy on people that are neither prepared to accept it uh, or, or be able to pay for it. Again, I talk to you about my district coming from a strong agricultural area. In an area where we have uh, farmers that are looking at alternative crops such as grasses, algae, uh, crops that make up biofuels. My concern is, is that we have, you know, uh, from, from a regulatory standpoint, choked so much of our industry. Is there anything that the EPA is doing to incentivize or encourage uh, a green economy by way of alternative fuel sources that are biofuels and not edible food sources either? Absolutely, sir. Under uh, the Energy Independence and Security Act, EPA is uh, required to uh, develop renewable fuel standards for the country, and we have done that and we will do it uh, uh, as called for by law. Those standards mandate certain amounts of biofuels to be uh, mixed in with our fuel supply, and of course that displaces gasoline in our fuel supply. In addition, EPA has, uh, again, by law, required to review an application for a waiver to increase the amount of ethanol and gasoline. So did, why is it just ethanol? I mean, why aren't we looking really? I mean, are we not affecting other market forces, food crops, uh, uh, you know, food sources and supplies when we're using an edible uh, food crop for, for a fuel source? I mean, is the EPA doing anything to look at other alternative green fuels that are biofuels? Well, certainly EPA is working to, in addition to the renewable fuels work, at our Ann Arbor laboratory, which works quite closely with vehicles, we are uh, looking at the impacts of uh, various fuels. We have quite an extensive uh, uh, scientific arm that looks at and supports private sector research on biofuels. Uh, and I believe that biofuels for the ag sector is a huge area of potential economic growth, yes. Uh, the other question, and I will pose this to both of you, is that being from Florida and, and 90 miles away from our southernmost border or co uh, city there uh, is Cuba. And, and Cuba, as we talked about earlier, is, is starting to look at uh, uh, offshore oil exploration uh, that will be just as close as the, uh, the Deepwater Horizon uh, was to Florida. Uh, are we doing, uh, do we know how far along uh, Cuba is, uh, Mr. Hayes, Secretary Hayes? Um, the company that uh, uh, that may um, go first in terms of off of Cuba is a Spanish company called Repsol that also does business in the United States, um, and they uh, they have been in and talked to uh, our department about uh, their plans. Uh, and uh, my understanding is that they're potentially planning to drill later this year. Uh, is there anything that we can do in terms of remediation? Uh, or at least enforcement of regulation to make sure that what is being done there is in accordance with what we require 
and our offshore drilling. This is a matter, Congressman, uh, that uh, is really in the province of the Department of State uh, and not the Interior Department. Um, um, so, uh, unfortunately, I am I'm, I'm not sure the, the answer to that question. I do know that the Department of State is, uh, is involved in this issue and following it closely. Would it be safe to say that the only hope that we have now is just a strong remediation program that will be located somewhere off the coast of Florida in the event of a spill? Well, our hope is that, um, that uh, Repsol in particular, um, which knows and uh, follows our own safety requirements, would do the same uh, if they were to, to uh, drill in Cuban waters. Thank you. I will yield. Would the gentleman yield? Yes, sir. Uh, for the Administrator, if I had the Department of Energy here, I would have three agencies, all of whom are studying fracking and its effects on water. Wouldn't you agree that when the President said we should eliminate duplication, that the three agencies that are all studying fracking right now should consolidate behind one of you rather than three redundant studies? No, because I don't agree that the studies are redundant. And uh, rather than consolidate, I would agree that we should coordinate, which is what we are doing. Well, I hope so. I recognize the gentlelady from uh, New York, Ms. Burkle. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you to both of our guests this morning for your uh, being willing to sit here and take this to answer our questions. Um, I, I had some prepared questions, but I, I first want to t just refer to some of the comments you just made. Uh, Ms. Jackson, I heard you say that the polluter is responsible. It was uh, in response to Mr. Or Dr. Dujardin's question. And I am concerned that you are looking at coal industry and the oil industry and uh, natural gas as a polluter rather than a job creator and someone who, these industries are the backbone of this country. It, they employ millions of people. They are a great source of revenue, a great source of tax revenue for the Federal Government. They are not the enemy. And my sense is, and when I talk to the small businesses and the large businesses in my district, that the EPA has moved from being someone who advises and helps and helps a business get on track and, and comply with all of these, just a whole host of regulations. Now the sense is that the EPA is, views this business as the enemy. And that is a concern, because now we move from being helpful to that business in, in making them be compliant to being punitive. And that is the feeling that is out there in this country. And that is, we, we men, many of us here, came to Congress, came to Washington because of our, our concern regarding jobs and the economy in this nation. The last thing we need to do is to be discouraging the job creators. And my sense is when the EPA takes on this aura of being punitive rather than being helpful, and I heard you mention about, well, we want to work with the community, we want to work with the businesses, that is not the sense I am getting out there out there from these people who are right on the front lines. So I would like you to comment on that and your sense of whether the EPA has moved from being let's help people versus uh, we are just going to be punitive. Well, two points, um, Congresswoman. First, uh, I believe you might be taking my comments a bit out of context. The question from Dr. Desjardins was about who is responsible for pollution. And so my answer referred to polluters because the question was in the context of when pollution happens. Please don't uh, uh, mean, take that to mean that I believe that all businesses are polluters. Far from it. The vast majority of businesses in this country comply with our environmental laws. They are good stewards. They want to be great stewards. Oftentimes, many of them that I have met with, and I have met with dozens and dozens of CEOs of large and small companies, come in and want to, and want to comply. So, and, and I do not believe that uh, EPA has moved into a place of being punitive. However, we have very much so set ourselves on the path of doing our job. What I said when I became administrator is that EPA was once again going to protect the health of the American people, not look the other way if there is pollution or if there is an, uh, an opportunity to ensure that pollution doesn't happen. Well, then, what is the problem? Is it a PR problem? Or when I hear from these businesses that the EPA and I, we, we were fortunate enough to have in district hearings for oversight and government reform, we talked to members of the agriculture community, dairy farmers, and their biggest problem was with the EPA. So there, there may be it's a PR problem, but my sense from the folks in the district is that it's more than that. Um, I, I also want to talk about um, 
Deputy Secretary uh, Jackson, you mentioned, or Hayes, I'm sorry, you mentioned about businesses, and it's really a business decision whether or not they drill or whether or not produce oil. But I want to emphasize that uncertainty is the enemy of growth. Uncertainty, when these businesses don't know what regulation or what tax is coming down the pike, that's the problem. So they hunker down and they won't take a risk. And so my message to both of you is, for the economic recovery of this country, for job creation, send a message to our businesses of certainty that you are not there to penalize them or to punish them. You want to encourage them, because this nation needs to create jobs. We need to get the American people back working. And with that, I yield back my time. I thank the gentlelady. The gentleman from Idaho, Mr. Labrador, is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Administrator Jackson, I, last, I think it was Friday, Thursday or Friday, I received a Google alert that um, surprised me a little bit. On the, in the uh, newspaper, The Hill, it quoted you as saying that um, apparently you were on The Daily Show. And on The Daily Show, you responded to a largely GOP claims that the EPA is overzealously pursuing regulations. And your response was as follows. It is definitely an inside the beltway line of reasoning. She said Washington is a place where industry interests peddle a narrative that transforms the beltway into a fact-free zone. And then you said outside Washington, and this is what made me laugh a little bit, maybe you were just joking because you are on The Daily Show, um, 95 percent of the American people say they want government. They see one of the roles of government is protecting the air and their water, she said in the interview. So do you really believe that the problems with the EPA are an inside the beltway line of reasoning, or were you just cracking a joke because you were on a daily show? Well, you should watch it rather than uh, read about it. <laughs> but, uh, you know, yes, I believe that 95 percent of the American people, as I stated during that show, believe that it is a role of government to protect them, to keep their air and water clean, to protect their health. And, but you, do you also believe that it is only inside the Beltway that where people are concerned about the EPA? No, I believe people have concerns, and I believe it is my job and EPA's job to try to address those people where they are. But I also believe that progress is made when we get outside of Washington, as I did when I visited your fine State, and spoke to people directly about what is really happening. No, we are not regulating cow flatulence. No, we are not regulating milk versus the myths that are spun up by professional special interests inside this beltway to scare people. Okay, the irony of that, that moment for me is that I went into a meeting right after I received the Google alert. And the first thing that the gentleman who was a businessman, not a, not a politician, he's not a, uh, you know, a career politician, he's not a regulator, he's, he's just a regular businessman, the first thing he said is, can we get rid of the EPA? I'm sick and tired of the EPA destroying jobs in America and destroying this country. So how is it that you can say on a show that, that it's an inside the beltway mentality where it doesn't matter wh where, who I talk to in Idaho, whether it's Republican, Democrat, Independent, they have a problem with the oversellers' uh, regulation of the EPA. First, let me correct an error in the record. I thought you said Iowa. If you are from Idaho, I haven't visited your That is what I thought. Oh, I so. am very sorry for that. <laughs> that is uh, okay. That is a mistake. And for the gentleman your constituent. You, you should visit, not just uh, read about it. Um, I am happy to go. <laughs> I have actually been, but I haven't been recently, so that would okay. be an inaccurate okay. statement in the record. That is okay. That is okay. I am happy to visit. Uh, you know, I am happy to speak to this gentleman, happy to speak to uh, constituents. What I would say is I would like to understand the reasoning behind that, because there are constituents in your state who we serve and protect uh, air quality or water quality, clean up Superfund sites. We are uh, quite busy on a range of issues. And so although I do not doubt that people have concerns about our agency, and as I also said on that same show, we can certainly do our jobs better and more effectively. We look for opportunities to do so. The poll shows that 95 percent of the American people think that the reason the EPA is there, which is to protect their health, is a function of government that should happen, that no one can And, and I think there. I would agree. I would agree with you that it is a function of government that should happen. But the problem is the oversell is uh, regulation and the oversales interpretation of regulation, and that is killing our jobs, it is killing our industries, it is ki killing our economy. And I think I would invite you to come to Idaho, 
and I would invite you to talk to the businessmen, to the mayors, the Republicans, Democrats, Independents. The, I, the first thing I talk to every mayor about in Idaho, it doesn't matter what party they belong to or whether they are nonpartisan, is about the EPA and about how much money it's going to cost them, the, the issues with phosphorus, the issues with the water. We have cities in Idaho that are concerned that over the next 10 years it's going to cost them over a billion dollars to, to remediate some of the things that is only going to improve the water by 1 percent or half of a percent. So these are concerns that we really have that are going to cost jobs, that are going to cost the economy. And I think that you need to be may, maybe uh, more concerned about what is happening outside of the Beltway, because it seems to me that inside the Beltway, all of your friends are telling you that nobody is concerned about the EPA. Now, Deputy Secretary uh, Hayes, just a quick question. You keep mentioning that we have actually increased production of oil. What is the reality about what happened after Macondo in the uh, Outer Continental Shelf? Has production of oil increased or decreased in that area? Uh, in the in the Gulf, uh, it it is uh, remained about steady at about 50 million barrels per month. In November of 2008, uh, the production I believe was 48 million barrels per month. Uh, the last year we have uh, monthly records is December of last year. It was 49 million barrels per month. Uh, it is anticipated, as was discussed before, that there will be a slight erosion. Uh, uh, potentially later this year or next year in terms of production uh, because of the delay in permitting that was necessary because of the, the disaster. We hope to make up for that, however, with, uh, with new discoveries that are now being drilled. The gentleman's time has expired, and I thank the gentleman. Mr. Gibbs, I, uh, I, I thank you for your presence here. Uh, if you will have all of your questions, if you want to ask one question before we go sine da, uh, I will certainly allow it. I just want to be respectful that the House rule is once the joint session starts, we must adjourn. Please. Th thank you, Mr. Chairman. I will try, try to be quick. Uh, you talk about the markets and the price. One thing I would like to just comment on that, uncertainty leads to the futures market, uh, uh, what the people in the market. In the market. So the market is functioning because this administration is putting out a lot of uncertainty. And one area I want to key on is a week and a half ago in my uh, committee, uh, the Water Resource Environment, your subordinate, uh, Ms. Nancy Stoner, testified, uh, Administrator Jackson. And it is appalling to me that here we had a, a, a coal operation in West Virginia that went through 10 years of environmental impact study, went far beyond what they needed to do, got their permit in 07 from the Army Corps of Engineers, and the EPA was working in concert with them. This administration came in in 2010 and revoked that permit after they spent $100 million in investment. She testified when I asked the question, would the State EPA of West Virginia, would they support of the revocation? They said no. Did the Army Corps of Engineers give any new evidence uh, that they were in permit violation or there was any problems? The Army Corps supply, didn't supply any of that evidence. What uh, basis does your administration have to go forward to revoke that permit uh, under law? The Clean Water Act, sir, and protection of water quality. And let me say for the record that that permit uh, had been issued by the Corps of Engineers over EPA's strong comments that we believe that it did not comply with the Clean Water Act. Uh, it, I think the, it, the, clearly under the Clean Water Act, when the, when the Corps issued that permit to EPA, if they had objections, they could have vetoed that permit at that time. They did not do that. Is that correct? EPA did not at the time, but that was during the Bush administration. After uh, President Obama was elected, and we now, were called on by the court to defend that permit. The time here, uh, this that's a very dangerous president because this is three years after the permit was given. So, so you know you're creating huge uncertainty across all sectors of the economy because who's going to come in and risk capital? What banks are going to loan money, knowing that at the whim of an administration, any administration, come in and revoke a permit? Uh, who's going to take that risk? So you're creating more uncertainty. And if you want to bring down gas prices, you need to put certainty out in the market. And you can't have actions like that was to happen at the, at the Spruce Mine in West Virginia. That's creating uncertainty. And, and you know, I've got other examples. The, the, the uh, uh, permit that has been delayed, delayed, and delayed up in, in, up in Alaska for a large oil company to get to the leased lands that they've leased. They've been, they've been stopped by the EPA and the Corps to build that eight mile road that the State of Alaska wants. The, 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 the oil company is going to pay for it, no taxpayer expense, and, and, and this administration has, has put roadblocks. So I continually hear in my committee uh, uh, roadblocks, barriers put up against the, the industry. 
to, to develop these natural resources responsibly, because I th clearly there is an intent by this administration to not want to develop these natural resources. I thank the gentleman. Pursuant to the House rules, uh, I, I, the gentlelady can answer, can answer briefly. Uh, we, are, we are going to have to recess in the balance of both his questions and answers. I would appreciate your answering for the record, but please. And, and I will submit a longer answer for the record. Let me simply just make three statements. This administration has not any intent to increase in uncertainty in the market. In fact, many of the rules we have done have been uh, intended uh, to uh, finally answer questions, many of them long overdue. With respect to the Spruce Mine case, this administration was uh, forced with a, a decision either to defend a permit in court that EPA had never agreed was given uh, properly or to exercise its right under the Clean Water Act to veto it. And finally, uh, happy to give some answers on Alaska for the record, sir. I appreciate it. And I appreciate uh, all the members' time, and uh, and you really you went past the hour and forty five that we said. It's a little over two, and as the uh, prime minister takes the floor, we're going to stand adjourned. And I appreciate your answering questions for the record.